Well, welcome to the David R. Anderson Memorial um, Symposium. And later on, a little bit of a celebration. It's good to see some faces I haven't seen in a while and some that I see too often. Uh, but uh, this, this uh, took a while to happen because of COVID as a lot of things, but I'm really happy to, to uh, have something to celebrate what David uh, uh, accomplished over his career. I'm also humbled uh, to be the host today. Um, the speakers today, me excluded, are a group of internationally recognized and distinguished individuals. Um, their impact in wildlife biology, ecology, and, and uh, um, management is incredible. They're individuals that have an impressive CV, hundreds of publications, books to their name, many, many awards. And so to keep things moving today, I'll have a short introduction, no more than about three minutes. Um, but many of you know what these individuals have done, and, and it is quite impressive. But I won't go through that list. Um, and they're all quite humble in that, you know, some of them sent me this thing that was really short. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm Jim Nichols. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful, you know. So, um, so I want to say up front, it is true. They're that impressive. Um, and to stay on, on schedule, introductions will be short. A few logistics, if you haven't been here in a while, um, bathrooms towards the center, back to the east, that's the east, the mountains to the west. Um, there are also bathrooms north and south down the hallway. Um, and you can go right down some steps right out here and you'll come out in the food court below and, and wander around to, to see different things. Of course, you know, feel free to come and go. Just please be quiet if you, if you want to chat. Just take it outside. And if you have a cell phone, which I do, and is mine off, uh, turn it off, please. Uh, we do have a sergeant at arms, and they will track you down. Huh? Um, somewhere we'll, we'll get to lunch, and there is the big food court down below, and many of you have been to CSU if you want to walk. Um, there are some food sources right over here on Laurel and up to college, and if you want to go a little further, you can go on up on Elizabeth. I'd like to thank two entities who made this happen, uh, the Department of Fish, Wildlife, in conservation biology, and in particular, the department head, Catherine Stoner, and the Colorado Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Unit, and in particular, the leader of the co-op unit, Dana Winkleman. Are you guys here? I know I saw Catherine. Have I seen Dana? <laughs> and Dana's there too. Yeah. Um, they generously provided funds, and so there hasn't been a charge for anything, uh, and there won't, uh, well, you have to buy your own drinks. Um, but uh, that's, that's it. Uh, so a, ser a sincere thanks to them, and I, I really do appreciate it. There was a group of us who sat down to talk about the program, and I want to acknowledge them, and that included Gary White, Ken Burnham, both emeritus faculty in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology, um, where we all uh, are housed, and then also David Otis, um, who was um, retired from Iowa State University and moved back to Fort Collins, and he's an affiliate faculty now on the department and, and, and quite active. He's off in Scandinavia. Yeah. Uh, and then there are the two most important individuals, um, Melinda Nybloom, uh, who's the uh, assistant to the department head and assistant to everything else in FWCB. Uh, she was here running around putting out a few things on the tables, but she's gone off um, back to work because the department head won't do anything. 
Uh, and then Kim Samsel, um, who is the administrative assistant to the co-op unit, and Dana and all the unit personnel's um, um, person to glue to keep them together helped. Um, and she's off uh, taking a little vacation with her family and so isn't here today. But both of them did all the organization, contacting the different entities, et cetera. Um, and being retired, I don't have any financial stuff that I can do for the university anymore, so they had to go transfer all the funds and things. So, if you guys are over budget this uh, year, blame it on yourselves, not me. Uh, so let's get started. To start things off, I'm extremely pleased to introduce Ms. Tamara Anderson, one of David Anderson's daughters. Tamara has a bachelor's degree in international business from that university in Boulder, you know, that university that will not be named. <laughs> okay. She's one of the nice people, so we'll say it's University of Colorado. Bunch of buffaloes. In reality, I think about three quarters of the children of CSU faculty go to see you. <laughs> I don't think it's the school, it's their parents. Uh, Tamara worked most of her career at Stratus Consulting, an environmental research and consulting firm in Boulder. They focused on natural resource economics and environmental sciences. She now works for a nonprofit called Environment for the Americas, which she calls the worst name ever. They do do some good things, though. They connect diverse people to birds and nature and inspire the next generation of conservationists. And annually, they put on the World Migratory Bird Day, focusing attention on that spectacular event that is bird migration. And it's pretty neat, considering early in David's career, what did he work on? Waterfowl migratory birds. Her hobbies include keeping her 81-year-old neighbor off of ladders <laughs> and the usual hiking, gardening, and Sudoku. And differing from her father, she's not into exotic cars. <laughs> I had hoped to introduce both of David's daughters, but Adrian, who I won't embarrass by pointing her out here, but she's over there at that table. <laughs> uh, she emphatically, in an email, said, threatened to vomit if she had to do any speaking in front of a large group. Her sister threatened to have COVID, <laughs> and she would have had to replace her, but she said, no, I just wouldn't have come. <laughs> it took a bit of arm twisting, but I'm happy to welcome Tamara to the podium. Welcome everyone to this symposium and thank you for coming. I know that some of you came from quite far away. What a wonderful turnout it is. Thanks also to Ken Wilson, Ken Burnham, Gary White, and Dave Otis for being the driving forces behind today. Adrian and I know that today will be very special. Thanks also to the heads of CSU's Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology, and to the Colorado Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Unit for providing important funding. Today's speakers will share a bit about what it was like to work with and learn from David. I thought I would round that out by sharing a few not work-related stories. When Ken Wilson asked me to speak today, the first story that popped into my head was about the first time I had a good sense of what dad's work was all about. It's hard for a kid to understand what their parents do for a living, and dad's job was no exception. I was about 12, Adrian was about nine, and dad had just come back from a work trip to Australia, and we were eating dinner at a local pizza joint. 
Our government had sent dad to Australia to determine if they were counting their kangaroos accur accurately. Our government was worried that too many kangaroos were being killed, and if that was the case, then we were gonna sanction Australia in hopes of getting them to not kill so many. So we sat around at dinner and we talked about how cute kangaroos are with their long furry ears and their big brown eyes and their little human hands, and of course the joeys. And then we asked dad, how many kangaroos did Australia have? And dad said, a lot, and looked sort of guilty. It didn't take long for that to sink in with me and Adrian, and we were not at all happy that dad was about to tell Congress it was okay for Australia to kill more kangaroos. <laughs> it was a long, quiet car ride home. <laughs> From then on, he told us much more about his work on endangered species, which we thought was far more appropriate. <laughs> Dad was born in Kansas, but he moved with his mom, dad, and brother to Denver when he was three. Eleven months after he was born, his brother Duane was born. They were thick as thieves. Duane very much wanted to be here today, but his health keeps him close to home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So he asked me to share a few short stories about what dad was like during his formative years. In grade school, David ran away. Not happy with chores at home, he packed up his bags and walked out the front door. A few minutes later, he was back with an ultimatum. He pointed his finger at his mother and said, I'll give you just one more chance. <laughs> In eighth grade, David's mother received a phone call. May I speak to Mr. David Anderson? His mother said, may I ask who's calling? I'm with Quivera Specialties in Topeka, Kansas, calling to confirm that we are interested in buying a dozen of Mr. Anderson's 13 lined ground squirrels. The sale fell through as the cost of getting health certificates turned out to be more than the squirrels were worth. Always a naturalist, David kept his Black Widow spider collection in a gallon jug under his bed. All went well until the eggs started hatching. It took several days to fumigate the house. <laughs> David's mother was also not happy about where he cleaned up after his amphibians. There were frogs in the bathtub and a musk turtle in the laundry sink. David, on the other hand, was not happy when the double tub Dexter washing machine spewed out hot water and roasted his musk turtle. After that, he began alley salvaging. Just before dusk, he would search the alleys in the neighborhood for discarded tools and building materials. He constructed two large concrete turtle ponds where his amphibians could live without fear of being roasted. By high school, David was a member of the Columbine Archery Club. He was an accomplished archer with a wall full of trophies to prove it. He won first place at the state flight tournament with a 300-pound laminated bow that he made in a makeshift oven in the basement. He also won trophies in clout, field, and target shooting. David was the local weapons expert. He was proficient with the bow and arrow, blow gun, slingshot, 22 rifle, and animal traps. He also had a taste for cherry bombs. <laughs> Although David went to Catholic school, his Bible was a frequently consulted set of Britannica encyclopedias, where he learned everything he could about turtles, snakes, rodents, butterflies, and the like. His parents drew the line when he wanted to keep snakes, and they also nixed the idea of raising nutria in the basement. <laughs> David the musician. David's parents sprung for guitar lessons sold by a door-to-door -door salesman. They made him practice one hour each day in his bedroom, so he closed the door and rigged up a pulley and string to strum the guitar while he sat in his rocking chair holding his favorite iguana. <laughs> school, not so much. David was a quick study, but never cared much about school or grades. He was something of a cut up, but his interest in nature and his desire to work kept him out of trouble. At age 16, David took a week off school with his parents' permission packed up his 53 Studebaker Starliner Coupe with his bow and arrows and went to Maybell, Colorado to hunt antelope. Result, one less antelope. David bought his own car when he was 15. 
He had a series of after-school jobs, including delivering the Denver Post, caddying, and being a checker at Miller's Grocery Store. The transition from high school to CSU. To his father's dismay, his father was something of an authoritarian. David came home from forestry camp at Pingree Park, sporting an Abe Lincoln-style beard. Basically, it was David's way of saying, I'm on my own, and from now on, I'll do it my way. And so he did, as evidenced by the content of today's symposium. Thank you. Wow, I wish I knew some of that information. <laughs> Here I tried to get good grades, tried, and little did I know. Um, it also reminded me that some of you probably remember this, Jack in the Box got in trouble because they're burgers. They were filling a little kangaroo in there for a while. <laughs> so uh, they still are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. 